Although you can find some basic stories in company accounts by looking at the profit and loss and income and outgoings, there are actually lots of other stories you can find by knowing a little bit more about some of the jargon involved in company accounts in terms of the notes to the accounts and also by understanding what's called the balance sheet. In this video I'm going to talk about some of those stories to look for, in particular those around remuneration, in other words pay, tax and debt. I'm also going to talk about some more jargon that you'll find on balance sheets in particular around assets and liabilities and different questions that you can ask a particular organisation based on different parts of their balance sheet. To begin with let's go back to this um, cash flow statement uh, similar to the one that I looked at in a previous video. Now again this cash flow statement identifies the money coming into the company and also going out of the company. Um, and I mentioned some basic stories you could tell about that in the previous video. Another story you can tell is by using this gross profit line and the cost of sales and the turnover you can calculate the profit margin of a, of a company. So by dividing the gross profit by the turnover or revenue that's how you get the profit margin of a company. Now obviously you can use that to compare different companies and um, talk about which company is doing better than another or which company's uh, profit margin has increased or decreased the most. You can tell stories about how that has changed over time. In this particular story the Bureau of Investigative Journalism have taken a very simple idea which is that house building firms were saying that they didn't have enough money to build affordable homes. They set out to check that claim by looking at the profit margins of the companies involved. And what they established was that by simply looking at their accounts they could see that their profit margin was more than healthy, uh, more than good enough for them to not be claiming poverty. They weren't really as poor as they were claiming. They could build affordable houses. A couple of other things to add uh, in terms of a cash flow statement. You'll remember that the cost of sales is the cost of buying or making the stuff that they sell, whereas the administrative expenses are the costs of other stuff that aren't necessarily directly related to what they're selling. In that line you might look for unusually big payments, big loans for example. You might look at the gross profit and whether that's unusual for the field that you're operating in. And a lot of this is about context, it's about whether this is you know, an unusual amount for that field or for that company for example. A lot of this detail is buried in the notes to the accounts, so you won't necessarily find it on this uh, statement here, you'll find it on further pages in the accounts and that's what these numbers here refer to. So in the cash flow statement you have a column called note and you'll see there's a note 2 here next to turnover, there's a note 6 next to interest, other interest that they're receiving and similar income and some more notes on the profit and the tax on that. And most of this video is going to relate to those notes to the accounts and the further detail that you find later in the uh, company report. Now one other thing to consider before we move on to that is that um, the different sources of income that are declared on a cash flow statement uh, can vary in terms of uh, where money's coming from. The main income of course is from operating activities, from basically the, the main business in the case of a builder their operating activities are going to be building and selling homes. But they might also have income from investing activities, uh, money that they've spent on expansion or selling off some of the things that they own. And in, they might have financing activities as well, they might sell shares to raise money, um, issue dividends and so on. Some questions to ask about those sources of income might be why a company is expanding a lot if it is or why it's paying out large dividends. And I'm going to come to a number of different questions as well as we go through that you can ask about different lines and dimensions of a company account. So these are the notes to the accounts in a cash flow statement. 
But in a small business, uh, sometimes you won't have a cash flow statement. You will only have what's called the balance sheet. In a balance sheet, you don't have money coming in uh, into the business in the sense of turnover and profit. What you have is assets, creditors, liabilities, uh, and capital and reserves. And I'm going to talk about that towards the end of this video. But again, we're going to focus on these notes, which are in the same place again in the balance sheet as well. Um, and the, the notes refer, as I say, to pages later on, and the pages will look like this. So in this case, note 15 refers to this bit. And again, it's notes to the financial statement. And we're on number 15, tangible fixed assets. We can see that this relates to that line as well. So everything here, the number 15, the term tangible fixed assets, we're in fixed assets, tangible assets, all connects up. So if you want to read more about this note, then that's where you go. And indeed, if you come across this note, just browsing through an, uh, a report, you can trace it back to the statement here. So that's how you find the notes. We're gonna now go through those. The first area I want to cover is remuneration, pay. I use the term remuneration because that's often what it's called in company accounts. Some interesting angles you might be looking for here are things like how much the directors get paid. Um, this will only be disclosed in larger companies most of the time, particularly if the company is listed because essentially the company is owned by its shareholders. Some things you might want to look for is how much the top paid director is paid compared to the average employee or the average UK wage or the prime minister or some other threshold. You might compare it to how they've been pay paid in the past. Here's an example from Sainsbury's accounts. And you can see um, we've got a couple of directors here, John Rogers and Kevin O'Byrne. And what's being shown here is how much they will be paid based on whether particular targets are hit. So at the very minimum, if uh, nothing else happens, they get paid this amount, about 970,000 in this case, 798,000 in this case. And that will be 100% of their earnings that year. If they are paid the maximum, so basically if they hit various targets, then they will get that money plus various other things. They'll get an annual bonus, they'll get a deferred share award, which is DSA here. Um, this thing called Future Builder as well, which is worth quite a bit as well. And they'll end up with 3.6 million. Um, these figures are in thousands, of course, so 3,611,000 is 3.6 million. And you can see this is explained below in terms of um, some of the different thresholds here. And um, you can compare this with things like the average wage of an employee by looking in uh, some of the other information in the accounts, if it's a big enough company to be able to provide this information. So in the case of Sainsbury's, we have the number of employees for this year. Now that includes directors. So um, you would need to find out how many directors there are first and de deduct that in order to work out um, how much salary they got. And likewise, the same for the employees as well. That, sorry, the cost for wages. So you would basically divide the amount of, of wages being paid by the number of employees after you've subtracted directors from both to find out what the average wage would be. But a much simpler story is simply to see how much someone's pay has increased, particularly if that company is under fire in some way. In this case, uh, the chief executive of uh, an energy company saw his pay bill rise, uh, or his, his wage, rise by 44% in just one year, at the same time as energy bills were increasing. And this is quite easy to find in their remuneration report. This is often a separate report. Um, that's published on its own in addition to the actual company report. And you can see here that we've got the amounts being paid, again in thousands, to each director and what they were paid in the previous year. So it's quite easy to calculate the percentage change. 
Another similar uh, story you could get from this sort of information is simply taking a group of companies, for example, football clubs in this case, it might be charities or churches or tennis clubs or rugby clubs. Uh, it might be any sort of uh, group of organisations that have something in common and then rank them in terms of the highest paid director's salary. This is something that's uh, quite often disclosed in large companies' accounts. The highest paid director's name isn't necessarily given. Uh, sometimes you can work that out, but at the very least, you can say how much the highest paid director got. Equally, again, you could do a, a story about companies which are failing to do something, failing to fulfill some sort of promise or um, obligation, and how much they're paying their directors. Let's move on now then to tax. Uh, tax is one of the obviously one of the stories that a lot of people will be looking to dig into in company accounts. It is quite tricky in a number of ways, but here are some techniques that you can use to look into it. The first is that, again, you will often find some sort of note to the accounts relating specifically to taxation, and that page will uh, generally break down the tax that they have paid and how it was calculated and, and uh, other aspects to it. So, for example, in this case, we've got a certain amount of corporation tax, but there's also some tax that they are deferring. So they, they are not necessarily paying it now, but putting it off to later. There are, in this case, some factors affecting the tax charge, and you can see it says it's different to the standard rate of corporation tax of 20%, and then explaining that below. Eventually, at the end, you get the actual tax that they paid, which is much le lower than the uh, tax at the top, which is almost double the amount. So this is where you can find more detail about how much tax a company actually pays. This is Facebook, by the way, here. So reducing its tax bill by about 50% between uh, the top and the bottom through various uh, aspects. So what stories can we tell about these? Well. Uh, generally, the stories that you can certainly tell are, well, how much tax did they pay um, and how does that compare to the profits? You can see this story by S.A. Matheson talks about tech firms in general and uh, it talks about Google, for example, paying 25 million in corporation tax, which is equivalent to 2.4% of its turnover. Now, we know that uh, tax is not paid on turnover, tax is paid on the profit that's left after expenses and, and costs are deducted. But obviously it's those expenses and costs that are used to manipulate the tax bill. So in this case, turnover is being used to put it into a, a different sort of context to the amounts that are actually being used to calculate the, t the tax. And again, this is where you might want to look at gross profit as another way of comparing rather than um, the operating profit after the expenses have been deducted. Here's another way of talking about the same story. And again, really, we're sticking to the facts of how much was paid compared to how much was sold. So in this case, sales surged to 14 billion, but Amazon only pays 290 million pounds in tax. Now, sales, again, is turnover. So that's before costs are taken out. But if the sales are increasing massively and the tax isn't, then that's a, a, a sign that something perhaps is happening that shouldn't be, that some extra costs are being added in to prevent the tax bill increasing. And often those costs relate to money being shifted to other parts of the uh, company structure as we will come on to. And again, alongside the facts, the, the technique for reporting these sorts of stories is to find someone from an organisation with expertise in this field to talk about, to kind of add some context and analysis to these figures. So in this particular case, this Guardian story, we have uh, the chief executive of a, an organisation called Fair Tax Mark, so campaigning for um, uh, taxation reform said it was very unlikely that the 50% jump 
in sales would lead to any increase, sizable increase in tax paid because a good proportion of their sales will be booked in Luxembourg where they engineered a loss last year. So where they, if you like, the money actually goes, they somehow in the books are, are losing money and that means that they don't have to pay tax. Now you can uh, see another example of a story based on uh, tax, looking at tax in company accounts and, and also looking more broadly at donations as a way of putting philanthropy into context in this video by the Financial Times data team as well in the slides for this video. So we've, we've touched a little bit on, on tax and I'll come back to some of this um, later, but I want to move on to debt and debtors now and in particular the, um, the balance sheet that I mentioned earlier next. Now why is debt and debtors important? Well probably one of the best examples of this is the story of the collapse of the firm Fairpack. Fairpack was a company basically um, a, a kind of a savings company where you would buy Christmas vouchers, you would send money off over the course of a year and then at the end of the year you would have these vouchers to kind of um, buy Christmas presents and um, uh, so it would stop you spending that money, you would, you would get these vouchers. Now one Christmas uh, back in 2007 lots of families were absolutely devastated at Christmas time when Fairpack, the company, collapsed meaning that they all of the money that they had saved um, was no longer accessible, it, it had gone. And uh, what had happened is basically Fairpack had lent that money out and it wasn't able to recover it. So in other words, um, Fairpack had debtors. It had people that owed it money and those debtors were not able to pay that money back. So one of the things that you'll find on a on a balance sheet um, will be and in the notes to the accounts will be information about how much this company is owed by other companies or people um, and, and perhaps when they might expect it back. You might see information about trade debtors. Trade debtors are people who have ordered things for example their customers or clients but haven't yet paid. Um, they might also be owed money by other companies in the same group. And this is one of those ways that money is used to, uh, that is used, sorry, one of the ways that is used to move money around a company group, possibly to reduce tax or to make some parts of that company structure, some companies look more profitable or secure than they actually are. Creditors is the uh, is the opposite of debtors if you like creditors are people that this company owes money to so uh, and in fact this is probably the reason why most companies go bust because they owe other companies money and can't pay them now when a when a company is asked to pay back money and it is unable to pay that back and and basically um, gets to a point where it's being asked for so much money that it um, that it can't pay all those debts, it's then eventually put into administration to pay those debts. So everything that it owns is sold. And we'll come on to um, some of the calculations around this later in terms of the assets that it's able to do that. But at this point, the main thing to focus on is, again, this, this terminology, this jargon, creditor is a company or person that this company owns, oh, sorry, owes money to. And again, a trade creditor is someone if you like, in the supply chain that they owe money to. So um, if you're um, selling books, for example, then you might have um, ordered some books from a supplier, but you've not paid them yet for that. But that's a trade creditor. And it's quite common for, for this to be the case because uh, companies give each other credit. Um, and in fact, if that doesn't happen, if there aren't any creditors then that's a sign that, that this company is not trusted. It's not trusted to be able to owe money because people don't believe it's going to pay them back. Now interest repayments will also be in the notes to the accounts and it's worth looking at the um, notes to the accounts and in particular 
related party transactions, which is where you might find more details about interest being paid to other companies in the same group of companies, the parent group. In particular, you might be interested in whether that company or another is based in a tax haven. So is money being moved around through this vehicle of interest repayments? So in other words, one company in a group lends money to another and then the interest is paid as a way of moving money from one company to another in that group. And often the different companies are in tax havens in order to uh, basically means that that money doesn't have tax paid on it or at least as much. You might want to see if it mentions the terms that the interest is being paid back on. Those terms might be extremely kind, uh, possibly suspiciously so. Equally, they might be extremely harsh. You might expect two different companies in the same group to lend money to each other on quite good terms, quite low interest rates. So if they're very high interest rates, is that uh, again, a way of moving money around. Uh, now, remember that tax is always an estimate, and when you look at the uh, the amount that was tax, the amount of tax that was paid the following year. In other words, uh, you'll remember that company accounts show both the current year's numbers and the previous year's numbers. Uh, when you look at, let's say. In 2018, you looked at a company's accounts and it said it was going to pay £2 million in 2018. When you look at that company's accounts in 2019, it will tell you how much it actually did pay the previous year. So that, that estimate can change when you look at the accounts for next year. And then dividends. Dividends are an amount of money paid to shareholders. When someone buys shares in a company, they're essentially lending that money to the company um, and if a company does well it's supposed to pay those shareholders back um, and these are called dividends. Now dividends are normally only paid when there's a, a profit or at least not a massive loss so if dividends are being paid when there is a loss then that is probably a bad sign. Likewise very high dividends um, as a proportion of profit would be a bad sign as well to watch out for. Another story to, to show you is an example of a story coming from debt and debtors um, is about uh, noticing the trend of football clubs turning to high interest loans. And I, when I saw this story, I started to, to try and figure out how they'd got this story. Where did it come from in terms of company's house and company accounts? And uh, you can see that the story mentions a loan to Derby uh, Football Club and that it was secured on Pride Park. And then in October, the club took a further loan secured on their training ground. Now, that link actually doesn't quite work, but um, I tracked down that what it's actually trying to link to is this. On Company's House, when you look at a company, as well as the company accounts, there are various other documents in its filing history. And one document to look out for is the registration of charge. A registration of charge is basically some sort of mortgage that's taken out. So in other words, them borrowing money. And just to check that, if you Google register of charge, you'll find guidance like this that explains what a register of charge is. So what this means is that basically the company is taking out a loan. And in the case of a football club, taking out a loan against a football stadium or a training ground is quite an emotive uh, thing. It's risking something that's quite key to that club's future. With things like this, uh, it's worth registering for alerts on companies that you're interested in. So in this case, it might well be that this journalist has registered for alerts on this particular football club, probably a bunch of football clubs, and has noticed these registration of charges popping up for quite a few, which has led them to write this story about a trend. So as well as being a, a, a kind of a tip about where to find information about companies taking out mortgages and loans on particular things that they own, um, it's also a tip about setting up alerts for uh, companies that are of interest to you. It might be because of the area that they operate in physically, 
you know, they're a local company, a big employer, or it might be because they op operate in a particular field, uh, a subject that you're interested in, fashion, music, sport, and so on. So in the final part of this video, I want to talk about assets and liabilities, what they mean, and, uh, and another part of the uh, company accounts that you might want to try to get your head around. And again, we're going to come across some jargon to do with what's called the balance sheet. Now, I've listed them here with a very brief explanation of what each piece of jargon means, but I'm going to go through each in turn in a bit more detail as well. So here is the balance sheet. In a small company, this is the only piece of financial information you will get. A small company doesn't generally include a cash flow statement like the statements that we saw in uh, at the start of this video and in a previous video uh, looking at some of the basic stories like profit and loss. So an, a, a balance sheet, and in this case an abridged balance sheet, all it really shows is what assets the company holds and who it owns, owes money to, uh, among other similar things. Basically, what this is about is whether this company can pay its debts. Is it going to go bust or not? In terms of the structure of this balance sheet, it's not quite as easy to read as, a, as a, the cash flow statement. Uh, which we touched on in the previous video, where money is being added together and then subtotaled as you go. But it is quite similar. So at the top we have um, fixed assets. And basically these are things that can be sold. So let's say that's worth uh, 4000 There's then a line about debtors. So that's how much money the company is owed. So if it called in its debts, it could raise 50,000. If it asked everyone who owed it money to pay up, and they all did, it would get 50,000 pounds. There's then a line on the amount of cash that's in the bank. There's another thousand pounds there that this company has. On the next line, we have the amount that uh, is owed by the company, so creditors. So this company owes 99,000. Now, then we get to the first subtotal, but what's, um, if you like, less clear in this structure than in the cash flow statement is that this isn't a combination of all the figures above. So we have um, 99,000, that's how much we owe. If we um, paid back 50,000 of that, by calling in this money from the debtors, that would leave us with £49,000 owed. If we used the cash in the bank, that would leave us with 48000 So it's this amount of money minus the money that it can easily raise to pay it. It does not include the fixed assets for reasons that we'll come on to. So what we owe minus what we can pay, in fact, quickly, or what we can quickly pay is really what we're talking about here. In fact, I'm going to say raise to pay it. Then on the next line, we take away the fixed assets. So we've got total assets, less current liabilities. So in this case, we're in a negative figure. Uh, we've got, we owe more money than we can raise. even if we sold our fixed assets as well, which we'll come on to. So this company isn't necessarily in a particularly good shape. If it sold everything it, it had, if it used all the cash it had, if it called in all its debts, it still couldn't pay off all the creditors. There are a couple of final lines here. One is uh, share capital. So basically um, the amount of uh, money that's been raised by selling shares. In this case, it's just three pounds. This is quite typical with a small company because when you set up a company, you quite often will pay one pound for your share in the business. So in this case, there's, there are probably three founders of the company. They've each paid a pound uh, to, to set up the business as their kind of capital investment. 
However, if the company was had other shareholders, they might sell shares for much more. If they sold 100 shares for £100 each, that would be running into the thousands, of course. So that's how much money they, they owe to people who bought shares. And then we have this retained earnings and shareholders funds at the bottom. These are sorts of uh, values that are placed on the company, which I'll explain in a moment. But basically, oops, sorry. But basically, um, one is about how much the business has earned and one is about the amount left over for shareholders. But both these lines are about the value of the company. And at the moment, this company has a negative value. So just to go to those two last points again, we have um, what's called, uh, in this case, it's been called retained earnings. Sometimes it's called earned surplus or retained capital or total accumulated profit or loss. And it's basically how much money has been made or lost since the company was founded uh, once dividends have been taken out. The total equity, on the other hand, is the value left in the company. So these might be two separate figures. There's more on the, at that link about the difference, but all you really need to know at this stage is that those two final lines in the um, statement, uh, in the balance sheet, sorry, refer to the value of the company. If I was to sum up all of this, or if I was to use someone else's words to sum up all of this um, in one sentence, it would be this, that basically to find out how much somebody is really worth, you need to know not what they own in terms of what they possess, but what they actually owe. And this is um, from Raj Bairolia's <laughs> book, um, which I'll mention at the end of this video, which is a bit of a Bible when it comes to looking at company accounts. So someone might own a lot of things, but if they owe more money than that, um, then they're still in trouble. And we're talking here about assets, what someone owns, compared to liabilities, what they owe. And the net worth of a company is basically those assets minus the liabilities. Now, this is a snapshot in when, when a company compiles its accounts. It's a snapshot that's taken on the last day of the year. So it can be manipulated, again, by moving money around between companies. Um, Lehman and the Anglo-Irish Bank are both examples of companies that, that kind of manipulated this in their accounts and collapsed later by leaving out debt and overstating the value of assets. In fact, I'll um, come on to that now. Now, in terms of assets, you'll notice that there were um, what were called fixed assets in the statement in the balance sheet earlier. And these weren't used to calculate whether someone could pay an amount quickly. And this is because fixed assets are basically long term um, items like buildings, factories, vehicles and so on. Basically things that can't be sold quickly. It also includes things like intangible assets, so the value of a brand, the value of goodwill. If this is very high in a, a, a balance sheet, then that might raise some questions because it, it might be being inflated to make it look like the company is healthier than it actually is. There's, there are also tangible fixed assets, so things that, are, um, that have a physical presence. And investments can be uh, declared as assets as well, because again, those might be able to be called in or sold. Some questions you might ask about assets include whether a company is planning to sell some assets that it has, um, or you might look at whether they've made bad acquisitions in terms of the assets that they uh, have, and are they trying to acquire more things to make up for those bad acquisitions. Now, a classic example of those intangible assets being inflated uh, comes in uh, Carillion's uh, annual accounts. You can see here that in their annual accounts, they value their intangible assets at 1.7, roughly speaking, million pounds. So these intangible assets, these things that have no physical existence, are valued more than the value of their property. And this is a building company. Carillion was a, a construction company that went bust. And we'll see that this was one of the factors in it going bust, or at least a, a, a clue. 
And in the notes to the account, <clears throat> you'll see that uh, it values goodwill as 1.57 million pounds. So this is, you know, basically goodwill. Well, you'll see in the next slide when Carillion collapsed, you can see that uh, one of the things it did in its uh, company accounts was pull forward hundreds of millions of pounds on profits expected from future work, so profits that it hadn't actually processed yet, and it still paid out um, dividends based on what it was expecting to earn in the future. Now, uh, it borrowed money to pay those dividends, and that debt was secured against this value, this this goodwill, this 1.57 billion pounds. And you'll see that, you know, this is how it's described, its brand name, its relations, and so on. Uh, it was actually their single biggest asset. So ultimately that goodwill couldn't pay the bills and um, they went bust. Now again, to, to demonstrate one of those breakdowns. This is what tangible assets looks like in the notes to the accounts. So in the um, in the balance sheet, it might say that tangible assets are this amount, but in the notes, you've got a, a much more specific breakdown, how much of that is plant and machinery, how much of it is uh, land and buildings. <clears throat> now current assets are something else you might see as a line in the balance sheet. And this refers to often to stock and inventory. Um, again, the idea is that that might be able, you can, you can sell it, but it might take a while to sell it. It actually might be obsolete if, it, if this is a tech company and it has some stock of phones that no one buys anymore, um, then that might be obsolete, it might be worthless. You can use the stock to calculate the turnover rate um, if you divide the cost of sales in the cash flow statement with the value of stock in any notes to the account, basically you get this turnover rate. And um, that again is an indication of the kind of health of the company if it's turning over stock quite quickly. And again, some questions you can ask about this include whether they have to write off stock or sell it below cost. Um, you can uh, look at whether stock turnover has changed, whether it's increased or decreased, whether assets have increased or decreased as well. We touched on cash earlier, what's sometimes called capital and reserve. If a company is holding large amounts of cash, that's generally considered a, a not a good sign. And you might want to ask why that's the case. Sometimes these figures are inflated by holding cash in the bank uh, and not paying creditors and then paying them after they've put the accounts through. Liabilities we've touched on um, and uh, this is obviously money that's due, that, that is owed, but there's a distinction made between liabilities that are due within 12 months, uh, these are called current liabilities, and liabilities that are not due within 12 months, what are called long-term liabilities. There's an obvious reason for this distinction. Uh, an account is an annual account, so it's really about whether this company can carry on operating for another year. So the, the any liabilities that are due, any loans that it's going to have to pay in the next 12 months are really key to the future of that company in the next year. Having said that, Long-term liabilities can still be an issue because they might have conditions that mean that they can become payable immediately rather than in the long term. So it might say if a certain thing happens, you need to pay back this loan immediately or within a certain period of time. Now, generally, again, the liabilities should be less than the assets because if uh, they don't have enough assets to pay off their liabilities, then that business is um, in trouble. Now, I've mentioned already about trade creditors. These are, are suppliers often who provided goods on credit. And I've mentioned about the fact that if there aren't any, this indicates that the Trump company is no longer trusted to pay. You do get companies that will earn interest on this credit effectively. A, a good example is a, a supermarket. Um, it might take 
let's say milk from a dairy, um, but not pay it immediately. It might take it on credit and pay that dairy a month or two or three months later. But when it sells that, that milk, it takes cash from the customers. So it doesn't, it's not, to, the customers aren't getting it on credit. So that supermarket will have cash in the bank for a good month or two before it has to pay the dairy and it's earning credit uh, on that, earning interest on that in the meantime, if there's interest rates. It might even be loaning it uh, and, and using that to generate income. There might be other creditors. Uh, as I said, often this might well be related companies as a way of avoiding paying tax or moving money between countries. So check the related party transactions at the end of the accounts for more details. And if they are going to companies in tax havens, you might want to ask questions about that or find organisations that are raising concerns about that. So here, for example, we have an example of a line in um, a balance sheet which specifies creditors and we have other creditors here. So um, this is 160 million pounds being owed to other creditors. And there's a note here, note 17. If you look at note 17, it might explain, as it does in this case, that that money is owed to the owner. But of course, the owner might call in that debt sooner than uh, the next 12 months. Overall, in terms of the notes to the account, some key parts to look at. We've covered a couple in a separate video at the end around ultimate controlling party and related party transactions. Uh, we've mentioned going concern as well as a key part to look at. Some other areas you might want to look at include revenue recognition, if there's any section on that, um, contingent liabilities, uh, and events after the reporting period. So in other words, um, things that might have happened since the accounts were compiled, which uh, have some significance. Uh, and in fact, going back to that, a, a classic example at the moment would be the pandemic. Um, a lot of the accounts that you uh, will have seen in the last six months will be for the financial year or for a financial year before the start of the pandemic. And there will probably be a note to the account saying since you know, this particular financial year, obviously the pandemic has happened and this will affect the business in many ways, which may well be listed. So some key points to summarise there. First of all, look for stories around pay. Look around whether pay has changed. Look at how it compares with pay at other organisations in the same sector. And look at pay in context. Is the company making a lot of money which justifies the pay or is it indeed losing money? Is that company being criticised for the way that it's serving its customers? Are there other reasons why that why pay might be important at that company? Secondly, look for stories about tax. Um, does the tax go up when the turnover does or is it not going up? Is there a reason for that? Are there concerns about that? And sticking with concerns, which is always a good thing to rely on as a journalist, um, does the company have enough assets to meet its liabilities or are there concerns about the future of the company and its ability to maintain, uh, to pay its costs, basically? I mentioned earlier um, the Investigative Journalist's Guide to Company Accounts. As I said, this is really the Bible in this, in this field. It's a great reference uh, book. Mine's very well fund and um, it's, it's pretty much the only resource on this um, subject. So that's well worth looking at. It's about £11 through the investigative, uh, the Centre for Investigative Journalism um, uh, and it covers all the things that we've covered in these videos.